let's go back pre-MTV, because this is fascinating and fantastic. Where were you before you kind of got into the media world, and what were you doing? When I got out of school, I uh, took a job in an ad agency for a couple of years, and yeah. they assigned me to Charmin toilet paper one day. And I uh, called a girl in Paris who was an ex-girlfriend and said, you know, you can't do that. So I quit and sort of went on a, you know, a long-awaited kind of uh, gap year, if you will. And I ended up in Afghanistan and India, and uh, I traveled all throughout Africa and everything, but I, I fell in love with the place. I, I couldn't believe this is all going on the same time I'd been living on the planet. So I lived there for eight years and started a couple of businesses so I could support myself, sort of a front for uh, being able to travel around. I mean, I saw a lot of territory in, in that part of the world. And then it kind of came to a bad end. The Russian invasion of Afghanistan, not good for business. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, I, I doubled down on my business in India, and that sort of got wiped out in a wave of, uh, you know, quotas and embargoes. And I, I kind of came back to New York with my tail in my legs, between my legs. Yeah. Now I had made a lot of money, but now I'm deep in debt. And luck and happenstance and timing is always important for anybody, but I ended up uh, getting an interview at what was going to become MTV. And they said, yeah, we're looking for people with no experience in TV. <laughs> I said, I'm your man. And I'm an entrepreneur. So they hired me, and I was like number five hired there, and I stayed for what turned out to be 26 years, you know, with Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, and so on. But it yeah. was a great run. Let's talk about the kind of the idea behind MTV when you started. Like when you were first brought in, what was the what was the mission? What was the mandate? What was the what was the we hear culture a lot? Like what is what was the culture the culture of a business? We hear that from people. But let's talk about what it was back then. Well, back then, I mean, it's hard to imagine. It was a startup, essentially. Even though we had two parents, Warner Communications and American Express, they didn't know where we even were. Right. We were in hotel rooms eating pizza like your normal startup of today. But the idea was there's this new medium called cable TV. There's a wire going into people's homes. They only get four channels now, and we're going to add specialized channels. They called it narrow casting. So the idea behind MTV was simple. Hey, there's, there's two things that the baby boomers love. They love music, they love television. We're going to put it together in a new way. We're going to use the music video, which was a program form that was sort of new to the U.S. I had known about it. And uh, we're going to do that, and then we're going to launch a children's network, and we're going to launch all these specialized channels. And it was like having a front seat at the beginning of the... Uh, video revolution, which we all think about nowadays as digital, but in, it was analog, was, was fun too. I yeah. mean, uh, it, it sort of begat a lot of change, and we've seen well that, where that's all ended up as of today. And so when you saw this explosion happening, is everybody, I remember when MTV first came out, and people were like, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard, music, television, nobody's going to want to watch this, and suddenly this thing went where no one anticipated. It became huge on a global scale. Yeah, like a lot of things, everybody said it wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. But those were like people who weren't in the demo. You know, they, were, they, were, they didn't get it. And in the early days, we never could get it in New York where we were working because the cable systems didn't carry it there. Couldn't get it in L.A. So you had to go to places like Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I was one of the first guys to go. And I remember showing up at Avis, and I had an <laughs> MTV button on my jacket. And the girl goes, wow, MTV. That's when I know we were sort of on to something. So it was... It, it was uh, Quite revolutionary in its day. Hard to hard to think of that now. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about that now. Like, what has happened? So this was, you know, eighty. What was that? Eighty one. Eighty one. Eighty one. Now here we are, twenty fifteen. What's happened to MTV during that time? Well, it's gone through a bunch of changes. I mean, one of the things we tried to do there, you know, we tried to be sort of what we call the creative first culture, and let's try reinventing ourselves and refreshing it. And, you know, we're, we're at the Zeitgeist Conference, and that's a word we always used to use. How do we stay in the Zeitgeist? What can we do this new and novel? So we went through various iterations, and we would find that the ambition of the people there was like we can produce more of our own programming. So we boosted up our news operation, we started doing more specials like Unplugged, and we added non-music programming for the first time, and yeah. found out that in adding that, you know, the ratings were generally higher, but we didn't want to walk away from music, that was sort of our soul, so we, we experimented with things, kind of like what Google does today, you know, yeah. we had little experimental pods of things going on, so it has, and I left like eight years ago, and uh, I haven't kept total track of it since then. Yeah. But I read about it from time to time. Right. So, 
<laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's been a, it, it was a generational media, uh, you know, business that um, it seems has fallen on some harder times right now. Yeah. Well, it's, it seems as though, as you were talking about, like, you talked about not being in the demo, it seems as though MTV is having a hard time to find that demo. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's a bunch of reasons for that. I think... Uh, one of them is their audiences are sort of like the canary in the coal mine in the TV business. Kids, teens, young adults, they're migrating to all these new media formats, increasingly, which are increasingly putting out more and more compelling programming, not to mention all the social elements. And yeah. rather than make moves to acquire any of those companies or build them or get into relationships with them, they kind of went the other direction. I mean, they sued YouTube, and which was uh, ill-advised, took out a lot of energy, I think really set them exactly going in the wrong direction. And then they, uh, you know, they kind of kept their eye on the bottom line. Um, they sold Vice, as an example. I had bought Vice one of my last years there, 50% of Vice's new video business, and they ended up selling that you know, to, you know, for like $3 million back to, back to Shane Smith. Um, and then they would use their money to do buy what they call stock buybacks. So there was yeah. a lot of $15 billion or $14 billion, I think, rather than investing in the business like yeah. Disney would have or someone else, they, they, you know, they were very bottom line oriented. And that's a problem when everything is in flux around you. Yeah, it seems like you've been on kind of the right side of history with this company for a long time. One of the reasons why Summoner Redstone you know, wanted you not in the business anymore is because you didn't want to buy MySpace. Well, which, he had a, which seems like a genius idea today, <laughs> when you I'm, look at I'm, MySpace. I'm still waiting for the thank you. <laughs> but yeah, he, he, uh, he didn't like that. He, he went on Charlie Rose and said that uh, he was humiliated to lose to something to Rupert Murdoch. So what are you, you going to do? Yeah. It, there's a blessing in disguise for me. Right. But if the, so now it's like, here's, here's another company, Viacom, that I feel like is floundering in a lot of ways that they don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they should be focusing their efforts. Um, I think their media choices are questionable. When you look at this company now that you've left seven plus years ago, what do you see in that company? Well, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, to give any advice because I really don't watch it that closely. But yeah. one would think, you know, you've got, um, it's a, you know, they're really in the kid, teen, young adult business. And, uh, you know, while there's a lot of things they could probably do to bolster up their existing businesses, you know, they could also be starting or buying new ones that really fit into this new media world where mm -hmm. their viewers have migrated and try and reclaim some of uh, their, their zeitgeist. Yeah, is there, well done. Is there, is, there still, is there still a place for cable television in today's world? Like when you kind of look, the numbers are down across the board, 30, 40% viewing audiences have dropped. Um, you look at the increase of the, the YouTubification of our, of our society. Um, is there still value? Is there still a place for that? Or is it, or is it an, old, an old model? Well, the model's definitely under stress, but if you look at it, everyone talks about cord cutting, cord shaving. I think there's like 98,000. In, in 2012, it went from 98 million subscribers in the U.S. to 97. Yeah. Now, it's probably going down further, but most people don't expect it like, to fall off a cliff. There's still, you know, people will still, like in younger demos, they'll still watch eight times more TV than they do watch online video. Okay. So, you know, there's still a lot of, there's a, the, the challenge is going to be to try and reinvent what these networks are and not just make them an amalgam of uh, undifferentiated shows jammed on a grid with 18 minutes of commercials an hour. Yeah. The uninterrupted, or the interrupted television model is really, really at the heart of this. Look at Netflix, look at HBO. They're doing fantastic. People are increasingly not into commercials. So if you can have somehow a situation that's less cluttered and more, you know, more sponsorship and more forms of innovation. That's something everyone would applaud. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, you know, the, the TV business and the bundle's not going anywhere really quick, right. but it is under huge stress. Listen, my mom's still got a VHS player. It's not going anytime fast. <laughs> you know, like she, there, there's plenty of people out there that are gonna be, that are gonna be cable for, for years. Yes. Yeah, it's just a question of getting that audience. You've been, you've been kind of at the forefront of a couple different revolutions. Music was a big one um, with MTV, news now being another one. You know, you've been a champion of Vice from very early on, as you said, you're still an advisor to the company. Um, let's talk about what Vice has done to news and kind of how there's been a paradigm shift with kind of their 
arrival into the marketplace. Well, Vice and others. I mean, yep. BuzzFeed, uh, Fusion, a lot of people have jumped into what really was sort of a white space left in, in the news area. I mean, the conventional wisdom was, you know, the millennials, they're not interested in the world. They sort of tune out. They don't care. But that is really far from the truth, as Vice and others have proved. And, yep. but, you know, while the news shows and the news networks on cable, their ratings are going down, I mean, the average age of those audiences anyway is over 60. Yeah. And, you know, millennials aren't exactly reading a lot of print, but there was a whole other way to engage with their desire to know what's going on in the world. So Vice, you know, they've this, they, they have uh, developed this great storytelling capability, and they try and, uh, you know, it's, it, they, they put on a news product that looks like it's being brought to you by someone like me. Yeah. I can do this. But by the way, they're not behind a desk. They go there. Right. They're there, and they're covering these stories, and they're covering stories that either no one else is covering, or they find a story that's been covered, and they think maybe they can do a better job at it, uh, and, been, and go through a cultural window to do it. An example might be they made a documentary called Heavy Metal in Baghdad. Now, there had been so much reporting on Baghdad on television on the Iraq war. They decided, let's take a look at wartime Baghdad through the eyes of a heavy metal band trying to survive. And through that process, uh, you know, they, they they were able to put together an amazing documentary, but they do, they do that kind of thing all the time. It's very uh, empathetic, very human, it's very immersive. They want yeah. to be immersive, so we've got a new deal with HBO. We're gonna put on a half hour newscast every night uh, starting early next year, and I would say this. Are they gonna have a guy behind a desk? <laughs> well, no, probably not. <laughs> we, that's what's one of the first questions that was asked. Yeah. Is there a desk? No, we can't do the desk. Is there a stool? Is he standing next to a stool? That has yet to be really figured out if there's a stool. Will there be an interatron? Stool or not. Will know? he have a pointer? <laughs> yeah. But HBO really upped Vice's game, and we've had a show on, and it's actually, you know, here's a digital first company that went into TV and because yeah. they were great. I mean, they've won Emmys. Yeah. And, uh, but this is, so here's a great question. So here, this is a digital first company that exploded onto the scene. Why, why TV? I, you know, like, why TV for them when they made that decision? Well, they learned early on, like I think a lot of people in this room did, if you run a, a digital business, you're not gonna, you're not gonna survive and be very prosperous relying on web advertising, on, on, on internet advertising. So yeah. they have decided they have about five or six different revenue streams, and one of the ones is they, they create television and they license it. You know, we have TV networks that we run in Europe now, or we license to Channel 4 in the UK, or you know, license to networks in France and so forth. So they kind of like that. And you know, like a lot of successful companies in the youth business, the, 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 the the employee population wanted to stretch out more. Yeah. So, hey, let's do television. We can do television. That's still sort of the gold standard for them. And they've uh, pulled it off in fine form. And they, 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 they see it as a, a way to make more money, to way to build their brand. You know, everyone says, well, you gotta be multi-platform. Well, that's more than just being on Snapchat and in Facebook and whatnot. But how about TV is still a platform, it's still yeah. being used, let's go there too. Well, do you know what, what, is their, what is the differentiation or of audience between the amount of people who watch on HBO or the amount of people who watch online? Well, HBO, they may not release ratings, but uh, they do you know, millions, uh, I'd say low single digit millions. It's good very, yeah. for that time period and what they do, it's very, very good. Right. Um, online, I mean, they do, if you look at the whole um, you know, sort of suite of all their digital uh, verticals. They, 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 they do about, this last month, they did about 100 million uniques. Um, it's incredible. So it's incredible. So, so, but, you know, the thing is online, of course, they're not all watching at once. But yeah. increasingly on TV, that's the case, too. Yeah. So they're, so they're creating amazing original programming, not only now for their own channel, for Vice, but also for their HBO programming. For those of you who may not have heard or known, they've now bought H2, H2, which was the second history channel They've now, but they didn't, I guess, they, this is being given to them because the A&E made an investment in them about a quarter of a, mil, a, quarter of a billion dollars, 250 million. Right, well, um, we didn't, uh, the, we, the, that deal isn't done yet. They made an investment last year and we're in negotiation okay. to buy H2. That used to be so we called the Nazi channel. That's right. Well, that's all they now, showed. All they all showed the was Hitler's, World War II Nazi Hitler movies. Stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so they're interested in, in becoming a partner with A&E uh, and rebranding this channel and making advice. And you say, well, Jesus, this, this is like the last days of Saigon for cable networks. What the hell do you want to do that for? But the yeah. fact is, 
they look at it in a, in, a, in a different way. They're saying, this is a way we, it's a content creation engine. We will get a lot of money from license fees and from advertising. We can use that money to make a lot more stuff that we're good at, want to yeah. do, and sell it around the world. And why can't we make one of these networks that maybe the world's crying out for, which has less clutter, is less interrupted. A little more focused. More focused, has, has a really cohesive image in terms of what they put on the air. Yep. And work much closely in tandem with their, you know, th the two other screens they're operating on. So now you're seeing this switch that happen. That hasn't happened yet. So Not yet. We're still waiting. Okay, so th there's this switch that's happening in news. How does we do the same thing? How does that happen now in music? The switch? Yeah, like how do you how do you how do you how do you become the vice of music now? You know, in the in this post kind of MTV I don't know. I mean, generation. The music business now. You look at it, and I mean, the streaming services are the huge thing. I mean, people have gone from you know that down downloads are on the on the down low. Yeah. And uh, streaming seems to be you know you can basically get every every record ever recorded for ten bucks a month. I mean, you just you're basically renting them. The music business has been through so many changes, it's hard to see. And, and first of all, you know, it doesn't have the cultural impact in the youth culture like it used to in the 60s and the 70s. It's still really important, it's still consumed, and it's still everywhere. But, yeah. you know, people used to line up for Sgt. Pepper at Tower Records. Now they'll, you know, they're lining up for iPhones. I mean, technology's sort of taken the place, if you will. Uh, that's not to say it's not important, but musicians mostly now are making most of their money touring. Yes. Those who have something, they're out and they're touring. Uh, you know, they're beginning to see revenue coming from the streaming services. People are barely buying CDs anymore. It's a tough nut to crack. I wouldn't want to be in the music business, necessarily. Being a promotional arm of the music business was what MTV was and what radio does. You could build a big business because people are interested in it, but it isn't, you know, you're not really vested in how many units somebody's selling. Yeah. You left Afghanistan how many years ago? I left in 1978. Yeah. When they had a coup. And then when did you go back? I went back in 2007. You were there then. Yes. <laughs> I didn't see you there. Didn't see uh, you there. I was at the Gandamak Lodge. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, so That's tell a whole me, other so, story. So what brought you back? What was the... What I was met the, a guy uh, who was an entrepreneur who was Afghan. Fascinating character. Fascinating character. And he uh, had grown up in Australia to some amount. And, he had tried to help this guy, Ahmed Shah Massoud, in the north. But he came back and he got the first license in Afghanistan for private television. Now, mind you, the Taliban, there was very little television in Afghanistan to begin with. When the Taliban came in, no TV, no radio, no music. We kill the musicians. Yeah. You know, can't fly a kite, can't do anything. We know that whole drill. So here's a guy who now we're going to introduce television, commercial television, to a country where 70% of the people are illiterate, which is landlocked and has essentially been cut off from the world forever yeah. and cut off from each other. And something has happened there in these, and I, 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 so I've, I saw it, was, it was sort of like being at MTV in the early days. I went over and started pitching in. It was fantastically exciting. They were putting stuff on the air, bringing music back to the country bringing news and setting up a news operation. And if you live in a war zone, you know, news is really important. And they, they were having great success, so I got to work with them. And, but it's, a, it's an amazing platform for social change. And for all the problems Afghanistan has, which are myriad, there are many, one thing that has really worked there has been the development of an independent media sector. And I'll also that too. Um, phones. There was 11,000 phones in Afghanistan 14 in two, years In 2007? Ago. No, in, in, in 2001. 2001, 11,000. Now there's 28 million cell phones. I mean, there's six cell phone, you know, six wireless providers. It's very booming. I mean, that's in a country of 30 million people. It's almost every person has a cell phone. And that really changes people. And they're really connected. And they're exposed to the outside world for the first time, connected to each other. If you think about just subtle signals you can send on gender equality with a male and a female newsreader up there at the same time, or we have a Sesame Street that we shoot in Farsi. We produce it in Afghanistan. And awesome. Half of, the, half of the people who watch it are adults. I mean, they're learning how to count, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, but in terms of people thinking smaller family size, well, that's cooler. You know, I don't want to beat my wife so much. That doesn't seem to be so good. I want my kids to go to school. All these kind of changes have taken place in this society, but, you know, it's still pretty fragile there and under threat because of the Taliban insurgency, you know, they've got the 8th century ideology, 
And here we have someone, that, this is the country wants to like stop fighting, it's been 37 years of war, and let's get on with life in the modern world and let's be tolerant and, you know, uh, it's rough to see that some of these gains now may be in jeopardy. Yeah. Let's open it up to some questions for Tom. We've got a few minutes. He's got some questions for this media genius. It's wizard. Wow. It's wizard that we have. Yes. Hi. Um, so I guess in the last week or so, two of the media stations in Afghanistan have been threatened by the Taliban. What's interesting to me is, is the fact that I think the median age in Afghanistan is something like 18. Yeah. Uh, so these are kids who have grown up with their version, I guess, of MTV. Um, and so what was striking to me, I guess, about reading the story was how little the Taliban has evolved since 9-11. And just, I'd love to hear your perspective on how the, you know, I guess, modern terrorism and what they need to do to, to, to make a world. We saw Pinker early talk about the, 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 the decline of violence. And I'm just wondering if the power of the media can continue to extend that the, this modern populace, these 18-year-olds, are not going to accept this type of violence in their country anymore. Well, because the Taliban existed there and were thrown out of power, and that's unlike most m Muslim countries where they, they still think, well, we want to have Islamic rule. They actually had it, and the approval rating for the Taliban within Afghanistan is like 6 or 7 percent. There's survey after survey done. They don't like the Taliban. Now, they're, they're, they have an 8th century ideology. They want to go back to the 8th century. Maybe they've moved up a month or two, but still... <laughs> they they've got longer swords yeah, now. They yeah. haven't changed. I mean, they went into... There was a city in the north called Kunduz that was fighting recently. They went in and they destroyed all the women's shelters. They destroyed the women's schools. They... I hate to say this, but last Monday, they, the military wing of the Taliban announced that the network that I work with Hello TV, that everyone who works there, including my good friend, is basically under a death sentence and because of their satanic activities and because they're propagandists for infidels and they reported on all these incidents in Kunduz that uh, were not really true, although Human Rights Watch and Amnesty and everybody corroborated it all. So if you think you have a security problem in your country, in your company, you, you wouldn't want to trade it for this one. So we're still trying to figure out how to weave through this because it, it's a very definite, precise military threat. And, you know, you just step back and say, well, how can a bunch of guys who were funded, put in business, and, and, and strategically placed by Pakistan, their, their very populous neighbor, how can they continue to disrupt things in this country and try and have things their own way when the people themselves, this younger generation and older ones too, really want to connect with the world. But, you know, they've got guns, and they're ruthless. And it's in a time, I was just going to say, in a time like this, how important is it to double down on kind of the, the investment, the manpower supporting this type of media? I think it's really important. You know, it costs uh, cost like a million four a year. Someone threw this number at me. It's a million four a year to have a Marine walking around Afghanistan. We spent, you know, several hundred billion dollars there. We've only spent couple, maybe a hundred million the United States trying to support entrepreneurship or private enterprise. We borrowed $250,000 to start what is now a three network group, paid it back, got it from USAID, and we we're self-funding. But, you know, if you go around trying to get money out of, uh, you know, we, we just seem to always, you know, lead with the military. And, you know, if, if you want to look at the Afghan war and the years we've spent there, we've, we've burned a lot of money in the street by ignoring the private sector and, you know, providing just basic things to the common population. Let's hear it from Mr. Tom Preston, everybody. Wow. Thank you. Yeah.